Good morning. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. It's Wednesday, January 10th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. The defense secretary's hospitalization and when he notified the White House creates a host of problems. We do not want this to happen again. I'm Lindy Kenyon in Washington. Donald Trump was in a D.C. court Tuesday as judges expressed skepticism that the former president was immune from prosecution. I'm Julie Walker. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is urging Israel to engage with the region on post-war plans. I'm Ed Donahue. Shutdown looms on Capitol Hill. Investors are waiting for news on the investigation of grounded Boeing 737 MAX 9 jets. I'm Jessica Edinger. The Biden campaign responding to former President Donald Trump about comments he made on the economy. I just don't want to be Herbert over. I'm Clayton Neville. All ahead on America in the Morning. The U.S. Defense Secretary's recent illness and hospitalization has raised a host of questions about delegation and notification. Correspondent Linda Kenyon has the story from Washington. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin had what was described as minimally invasive surgery for prostate cancer December 22nd after learning of his diagnosis in early December. He was sent home after the surgery but suffered complications and was admitted to Walter Reed Army Medical Center January 1st. Secretary Austin transferred his authorities to his deputy on January 2nd until January 5th. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, speaking to reporters Tuesday, described when President Biden was informed. He was not informed until last Friday that Secretary Austin was in the hospital. He was not informed until this morning that the root cause of that hospitalization was prostate cancer. Pentagon Press Secretary Major General Patrick Ryder says Secretary Austin has since spoken to the president and has addressed the transparency and national security concerns. Secretary Austin has taken responsibility for the issues with transparency, and the department is taking immediate steps to improve our notification procedures. The White House Chief of Staff is taking steps, too, ordering all cabinet heads to provide their notification and delegation procedures by Friday. Admiral Kirby says the point is to make sure this doesn't happen again. We all recognize that this didn't unfold the way it should have on so many levels, not just the notification process up the chain of command, but the transparency issue. We all recognize that. And and I think we all want to make sure we learn from that. When asked if the president has confidence in the defense secretary following this incident. In every way, Secretary Austin has been an exceptional defense secretary, and he still has the full faith and confidence of the commander in chief. Uh, He has led uh, the department at an incredibly dangerous time for uh, our national security interests and those of our allies and partners. As for Austin's health, General Ryder says. His prostate cancer was detected early and his prognosis is excellent. But the dust up this has created is not over. Some members of Congress have expressed serious concerns about the failure to notify key officials in the Biden administration. Some Republicans have called for Austin's resignation nation, while the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee has launched a formal investigation. Linda Kenyon, Washington. Donald Trump spent Tuesday in a Washington, D.C. courtroom as a federal appeals panel of judges heard arguments for and against that the former president was immune from prosecution on charges he plotted to overturn the 2020 election. Correspondent Julie Walker reports. It's the opening of a Pandora's box, and it's a very It's a very sad thing that's happened with this whole situation. Uh, When they talk about uh, threat to democracy, that's your real threat to democracy. And I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. Very simple. After the hearing, Donald Trump said it went well and pressed his case that he was fighting voter fraud. I think we're doing very well. I think it's very unfair when a opponent, a political opponent, is prosecuted by the DOJ, by Biden's DOJ, A president has to have immunity. In court, Trump's lawyer John Sauer argued without immunity, presidents could be prosecuted for giving Congress false information to enter war or authorizing drone strikes targeting U.S. citizens abroad. To authorize the prosecution of a president for his official acts would open a Pandora's box from which this nation may never recover. But there was skepticism about those arguments from the panel of three federal appeals court judges, which includes Judge Karen Henderson, appointed by George H.W. Bush. I think it's paradoxical to say that his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed allows him 
to violate criminal laws. And Assistant Special Counsel James Pierce also pushed back, saying the president has a unique constitutional role, but he's not above the law. This case, in which the defendant is alleged to have conspired to overturn the results of a presidential election, is not the place to recognize some novel form of criminal immunity. Special Counsel Jack Smith's office is hoping for a swift decision to get the case moving. Trump's lawyers want the case dismissed or at least delayed potentially until after the election. By normal standards, if it weren't me, that would be the end of this case. But sometimes they look at me differently than they look upon others, and that's very bad for our country. I'm Julie Walker. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken meets with Benjamin Netanyahu when America in the Morning continues after these messages. This is America in the Morning. Clean up in portions of the east after a storm went through yesterday. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Carl Erickson. Well, even though the worst of the heavy rain and strong winds are exiting the mid-Atlantic and southern New England today, many people across these areas, including the I-95 corridor from New York City to the nation's capital and right down through eastern Virginia, can still have lingering impacts from flooding and damage from heavy rain and strong winds overnight. Aside from a passing shower, no more heavy rain is expected in these areas today, but it will stay very windy. Further north, Boston will be drying out today, but it will take until this afternoon for rain to taper off across northern New England. As drier air sweeps in from west to east, it will remain very windy throughout the day. There will be a lingering couple of snow showers across the Great Lakes states and upper Ohio Valley, but any additional accumulations will be minor on the order of a coating to perhaps an inch in spots. After yesterday's severe storms and heavy rain, the southeast will have much quieter weather today with more than a way of sunshine with highs in the 50s with 60s and 70s over Florida. The southern plains into Texas and through the desert southwest will also have dry and calm weather today with partly the mostly sunny skies. Meanwhile, a fast-moving clipper-type storm will spread a swath of snow across parts of the northern plains and upper Midwest, which may leave a quick 1 to 3 inches of accumulation from the eastern Dakotas into Minnesota today, and that will spread into Wisconsin tonight. The west coast will remain quite active, with more rain for western parts of Washington and Oregon into northern California. Showers can even reach as far south as San Francisco and Fresno later on today. More snow will pile up across the Cascades, Intermountain West, and into the northern and central Rockies. And that's the weather across America. In New York City today, windy with a shower, high 50. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, sunny and a high of 62. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Kai Erickson. Follow us everywhere you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. After meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Tel Aviv, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is urging Israel to engage with the region on post-war plans as they continue their battle with Hamas. Ed Donahue reports. The charge of genocide is meritless. It's particularly galling, given that those who are attacking Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, as well as their support of Iran, continue to openly call for the annihilation of Israel and the mass murder of Jews. Blinken says every partner he has met on this trip say they're ready to support a lasting solution that ends the cycle of violence and ensures Israel's security. Every partner that I met on this trip said that they're ready to support a lasting solution that ends the long-running cycle of violence and ensures Israel's security. But they underscored that this can only come through a regional approach that includes a pathway to a Palestinian state. The U.S. and Israel are united against Hamas, but are sharply divided on the future of Gaza. Israel must be a partner to Palestinian leaders who are willing to lead their people in living side by side in peace with Israel uh, and uh, as neighbors. And Israel must be uh, must stop taking steps that undercut Palestinians' ability to govern themselves effectively. Israel has vowed to keep going until it destroys Hamas. A military spokesman says the fighting will continue throughout 2024. I'm Ed Donahue. Shut down showdown on Capitol Hill with just over a week before the government is set to shutter some agencies. And despite a deal made between Chuck Schumer in the Senate and Mike Johnson in the House, Senate Republicans now want to extend the current funding levels to renegotiate spending bills. 
The move, triggered by Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, comes as House conservatives are signaling they will vote against the current agreement, as the House Freedom Caucus posted on X, quote, it's even worse than we thought, end quote. Federal funding expires for some agencies January 19th, others on February 2nd. When we return on America in the Morning, the U.S. is no longer the largest world exporter of automobiles. That and more after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. There was mass confusion on Wall Street before the closing bell when the SEC's X account had a post saying that the Securities and Exchange Commission had approved Bitcoin's ETF for trading, causing that cryptocurrency to spike. The problem was the SEC didn't post that news and soon after admitted their social media platform had been compromised. The SEC is expected to make a decision later this week after more than a dozen asset managers filed applications to create a Bitcoin fund. More in Wall Street News with CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after a mixed day for stocks yesterday. The Dow broke its three-day winning streak. Former President Trump got Wall Street's attention when he said he hopes the economy crashes this year. But it isn't so far. Investors are waiting for fresh inflation data on Thursday. It's been going down pretty steadily. And the unofficial start of earnings season happens Friday. I think we're still in this mode of uh, figuring out whether the little minor pullback we got last week was enough to, to kind of refresh the market. Be surprising if that's all we needed. And maybe we can go sideways, chop around preliminaries because we're waiting. Let's be sure that our conviction about inflation remains well placed and that it remains firmly on the downswing. CNBC's Mike Santoli. Boeing's CEO responding to a scary midair fuselage blowout on one of its 737 MAX 9 jets owned by Alaska Airlines Friday. The CEO held an all-employee town hall. Out in Renton, Washington at the 737 MAX plant, an employee safety town hall led by Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun. There has to be a better performance by the company, especially when it comes to quality control. Uh, you cannot have planes uh, certainly can't have planes with parts falling off. That's the focus of it. CNBC's Phil LeBeau. About 140 jets are grounded this morning, owned by both Alaska and United Airlines. Some investors are questioning whether Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun can keep his job. Couldn't come at a worse time for him. I mean, this was the year they were going to turn everything around, and now they're right back where they have been for the last five years. And I think Calhoun needs to do something drastic, and the company needs to do something drastic to get out of this. It sounds like more of the same is going on at the organization. Dartmouth Business School corporate comm professor Paul Argenti. The U.S. loses its foothold on being the largest exporter of automobiles. Yeah, China is set to overtake Japan as the world's largest exporter of cars. China, as the largest car market, is now set to become the largest car exporter. A huge part of it is the economy here is slowing down, so there's a big a car slump. The excess capacity export drive is part of a government strategy to subsidize the market, to create a local market, and then uh, dominate the global market. One auto analyst, uh, Michael Dunn, saying that Chinese EV makers are sitting on enough capacity to supply 75 percent of global EV demand, that should keep Western automakers awake at night. CNBC's Yunus Yun in Beijing. On today's watch list, it's media day number two at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And Disney begins paying a dividend again today after a three-year break. Thank you, CNBC's Jessica Edinger. Donald Trump's comments on the economy raise the ire of the Biden campaign when America in the Morning continues after these messages. America in the Morning returns. The Biden campaign is snapping back at former President Trump following comments he made about the economy crashing under President Biden's leadership. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports. The comments by former President Trump were made during an interview with Lou Dobbs. We have 
an economy that's incredible. We have an economy that's so fragile. And the only reason it's running now is it's running off the fumes of what we did, what the Trump administration. It's just running off the fumes. The interview aired on frankspeech.com. That's an outlet run by my pillow founder, Mike Lindell. When there's a crash, I hope it's going to be during this next 12 months because I don't want to be Herbert Hoover. The one president, I just don't want to be Herbert Hoover. President Hoover had only been in office a few months when the Great Depression was triggered by a stock market crash in 1929. Now, in response to Trump's comments, President Biden's campaign manager said, quote, Donald Trump should just say he doesn't give a damn about people because that's exactly what he's telling the American people when he says he hopes the economy crashes. End quote. The Biden campaign went on to suggest Trump's rooting for a reality where millions of Americans lose their jobs and live with the anxiety of figuring out how to afford basic needs. I'm Clayton Neville. The American Red Cross announced that it's experiencing the lowest number of people donating in the last 20 years. The Red Cross says that the number of people giving blood has dropped by 40 percent over the last two decades and that the shortage could worsen in coming months due to winter weather or respiratory illnesses like the flu or COVID-19 causing people to cancel their donation appointments. The Red Cross adds that donors of all types, especially with type O blood and those giving platelets, are urged to give now. America in the Morning for Wednesday, January 10th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay. Senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour. The Pentagon says Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has prostate cancer. His infection is cleared. Ed Donahue, Washington. As Trump deals with legal woes, his rivals try to narrow the gap ahead of Monday's Iowa caucus. I'm John Stolness in Washington. A mixed bag of weather impacting the United States. I'm Clayton Neville. Air Force Two, carrying Vice President Kamala Harris, had to be diverted because of stormy weather. I'm Norman Hall. Teachers alleged inappropriate contact with her students investigated. Quarterback Aaron Rodgers denied he implied comedian Jimmy Kimmel was a pedophile, but stopped short of apologizing. I'm Archie Zaroleta with the latest. Back after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. Almost out to sea now, a storm that's been making its way across the country. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Carl Erickson. Although the storm is pulling away today, its effects are still being felt. Rain will gradually taper off this afternoon across northern New England, while most of the heavy snow shifts north into eastern Canada. And even though the worst of the heavy rain and strong winds are departing the mid-Atlantic and southern New England today, many people across these areas, including the I-95 corridor from New York City to the nation's capital and down through eastern Virginia, can still have lingering impacts from flooding and damage from heavy rain and strong winds overnight. Aside from a passing shower, no more heavy rain is expected in these areas today, but will remain quite windy. Further north, Boston will be drying out today. As dry air sweeps in, though, from west to east, it stays very windy through this evening. There will be a few lingering snow showers across the Great Lakes states and upper Ohio Valley, but any additional accumulations will be minor, a coating to perhaps an inch in spots. After yesterday's severe storms and heavy rain, the southeast will have much quieter weather today with more in the way of sunshine with highs in the 50s with 60s over Florida, even some 70s found over southern parts of the Sunshine State. The southern plains into Texas and through the desert southwest will also have dry and calm weather today with partly the mostly sunny skies. A fast-moving clipper type storm will spread snow across parts of the northern plains and upper Midwest, which may leave a quick 1 to 3 inches of accumulation from the eastern Dakotas into Minnesota today, then spreading through Wisconsin tonight. The West Coast will remain quite active with more rain for western parts of Washington and Oregon into northern California. Showers can reach as far as south as San Francisco and Fresno later today. More snow will pile up across the Cascades, Intermountain West, and into the northern central Rockies, with another three to six inches likely in many of these locations through tonight. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Kai Erickson. Don't forget to follow us everywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. 
I'm John Trout. Amidst calls for his resignation by some, confusion with the Biden administration about his whereabouts and secrecy about his condition, the Pentagon says Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was hospitalized with complications from prostate cancer. Ed Donahue has the latest. He was not informed until last Friday that Secretary Austin was in the hospital. He was not informed until this morning that the root cause of that hospitalization was prostate cancer. We do not want this to happen again, obviously. Uh, but, you know, we're going to get a better sense once the Pentagon does the 30-day review uh, to see how this occurred. Obviously, this is not something we want to see. Pentagon spokesman Major General Pat Ryder says the 70-year-old Austin was admitted to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center last month and had surgery to treat the cancer. His prostate cancer was detected early and his prognosis is excellent. But there was a complication, a urinary tract infection a week later. That sent Austin back to Walter Reed. Reed. He's still there. He's progressed steadily throughout his stay. His infection is cleared. He continues to make progress and we anticipate a full recovery. Senior administration and defense officials were not told for days about this. Secretary Austin has taken responsibility for the issues with transparency and the department is taking immediate steps to improve our notification procedures. Ryder says a review has started. This review is going to help us get to ground truth in a holistic way um, so that, that we can learn from it importantly, but also ensure that we're, we're doing better next time. The White House Chief of Staff is ordering cabinet secretaries to notify his office if they ever can't perform their duties. The Chief of Staff also directed several actions to ensure increased situational awareness about any transfer of authorities from the Secretary of Defense to include ensuring that the DOD General Counsel, the Chairman and Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the combatant commanders, the service secretaries, the service chief of staffs, the White House Situation Room and senior staff of the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of Defense are all notified. Ed Donahue, Washington. With the Iowa caucuses now just five days away, the GOP presidential field tries narrowing the gap with Donald Trump, who spent his Tuesday in the nation's capital. John Stolnes is following the campaign from Washington. The former president was not in the Hawkeye State or New Hampshire yesterday. Instead, he spent the day inside a D.C. courtroom. As his lawyers argued, he should be shielded from any federal prosecution for acts he performed as president of the United States. Speaking to reporters afterward. A president has to have immunity. And the other thing is I did nothing wrong. We did nothing wrong. He argued the cases being brought against him are part of a Democratic-run political witch hunt. That will be bedlam in the country. It's a very bad thing. It's a very bad precedent. As we said, it's the opening of a Pandora's box. And Trump noted if he does lose this case, even his predecessors could be brought up on charges. President Obama with the drone strikes, which were very bad. The attorney for the special counsel, James Pierce, argued the former president is responsible for any potential illegal actions. Never in our nation's history until this case has a president claimed that immunity and criminal prosecution extends beyond his time in office. His top two competitors, meanwhile, continued trying to narrow the gap in Iowa and New Hampshire. Ron DeSantis, participating in a Fox News town hall, said Trump is a distraction. What do we want the 2024 election to be about? Uh, because, you know, if Donald Trump is the nominee, the election is going to be about legal issues, criminal trials, January 6th. It'll be a referendum on him. DeSantis also spent time in his home state of Florida delivering his State of the State address yesterday. Meanwhile, in snow-covered Iowa, a number of campaign events were canceled this week due to weather, but Nikki Haley found time to campaign and appeared on Newsmax, echoing DeSantis's claims a distracted Trump hurts their chances of beating President Joe Biden. I've said rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. Two new polls out this week offer differing takes on the state of the race. A new CNN poll finds Haley narrowing the gap to just seven points in New Hampshire, while a USA Today Suffolk poll has the margin at plus 20 for Trump. Our goal is to be strong in Iowa, strong in New Hampshire, strong in South Carolina. We won't know what strong looks like until we see Election Day and see how the numbers fall out. But we feel really good. The momentum on the ground is good. Trump, who was among the first to make birther claims against then-President Obama, as well as Senator Ted Cruz, now appearing to support those same arguments against Haley. Trump posted an article on his Truth social media account from a right-wing outlet that claimed Haley was ineligible to run because her parents did not become citizens until after she was born. Haley was born in South Carolina and has lived in the U.S. her entire life. 
John Stolnes, Washington. 47 American states are under a variety of weather alerts dealing with rain and flooding, tornadoes, a large number of power outages, and blizzard conditions. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports on the wide-ranging impacts. Severe weather, including several tornadoes, hit parts of Florida on Tuesday. Damaging winds up to 70 miles an hour and tornadoes and large hail are possible. Stern warnings throughout the day from state leaders, including Governor Ron DeSantis, who said that recovery is happening now after a day of rain and severe weather. Those guys are already on the ground um, helping with the damage assessments and will have whatever help they need. Roofs blown off homes in widespread damage in the Panama City area. CBS News spoke with concerned tourists and residents in Florida. It was a freight train hitting a brick wall. That's how loud it was. It was extremely scary in the house. In the Northeast, the story's also the driving rain and potential for serious flooding as locals lay sandbags to protect homes and businesses. Water was up to my door, so I had to roll my pants up, uh, put my shoes in my book bag. I had to actually walk through that water to get out of there. 84 million people were under flood watches and warnings along the East Coast as of late last night. Vice President Kamala Harris's flight on Air Force Two was diverted because of weather. 140,000 customers were without power in Florida, Alabama, and Georgia late last night. Meanwhile, the story in the Midwest, the blanketing snow. A winter blast dropped around 8 to 12 inches of snow across Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota, Western Iowa and southwestern Minnesota also hit hard. Parts of South Dakota saw as much as 15 inches of snow. I'm Clayton Neville. When we return on America in the Morning, teenagers to see less on Instagram and Facebook. And then, teacher arrested for inappropriate contact with her high school student. Those stories and more when we return after these messages. This is America in the Morning. I'm John Trout. Officials say an American citizen has been arrested on drug charges in Russia, a move that comes amid soaring Kremlin-U.S. tensions over Ukraine. Correspondent Charles de Ledesma reports. The arrest of Robert Woodman Romanov was reported by the press service of the Moscow courts. It said a district court had ruled on Saturday to keep Romanov in custody for two months on charges of preparing to get involved in illegal drug trafficking, pending an official probe. It didn't offer any details of the accusations. Russian media has noted that the name of the accused matches that of a US citizen interviewed by a popular daily in 2020. The news about the arrest comes as Washington has sought to win the release of jailed Americans Paul Whelan and Evan Gershkovich. I'm Charles de Ledesma. The mother of former First Lady Melania Trump has passed away. Emilia Novs had been hospitalized recently and was 78 years old. She and her husband Victor became U.S. citizens in 2018, while their son-in-law was president and were living at Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort for the past two years. No cause of death was given. Social media giant Meta says it'll start hiding inappropriate content from teenagers' accounts on Instagram and Facebook. Lisa Dwyer has that story. Meta says that while it already aims to not recommend such age-inappropriate materials to teens, such as posts about suicide, self-harm, and eating disorders, Meta will now also not show such posts in their feeds, even if it's shared by an account they follow. Teen users, provided that they did not lie about their age when they signed up for Instagram or Facebook, will also see their accounts placed on the most restrictive settings on the platforms, and they will be blocked from searching for terms that might be harmful. Meta's announcement comes as the company faces lawsuits from dozens of U.S. states for contributing to the youth mental health crisis and harming young people. I'm Lisa Dwyer. A high school teacher has been arrested, charged with statutory rape for allegedly having sex with a 16-year-old student. But she may not be the only one in trouble. Missouri's Pulaski County Prosecutor's Office says Lackey High School math teacher Haley Clifton Carmack 
was arrested in Texas trying to avoid arrest warrants. Police also learned that other students served as lookouts while the in-school tryst was happening. Meanwhile, the teenager's father, identified as Mark Creighton, was also arrested and charged with endangering the welfare of a child after he revealed to others that he was aware of student-teacher relationships and did not alert authorities. America in the Morning continues. A scare in the skies for VP Kamala Harris traveling on Air Force Two. Correspondent Norman Hall reports. Vice President Harris's aircraft was forced to divert to a Washington area airport after encountering stormy weather Tuesday night as she returned from a trip to Georgia. Harris's press secretary says the plane was diverted from Joint Base Andrews to Dulles International Airport. A person familiar with the matter said the aircraft encountered wind shear as a powerful storm brought high winds and rain to the nation's capital. Wind shear is a sudden shift in wind direction or speed that can be hazardous during takeoff and landing. There were no injuries. I'm Norman Hall. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is promising tighter scrutiny and regulation of how you spend your money online. That story in today's Tech News with our Chuck Palm. A tech watchdog organization, the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, are looking for government regulations on digital wallets. The Computer Communications Industry Associations, whose members include Amazon, Facebook parent Meta, and X, formerly Twitter, responded to a proposal in November by the CFPB, which said the tech giant smartphone payments and wallet services rivaled traditional payment methods, but lacked the same consumer safeguards. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau said that they would subject companies to have the same kind of supervision that is currently imposed on banks with agency examiners inspecting compliance as well as investigating deceptive practices, privacy protections, and scrutinizing executives' conduct. Some bank executives reacted warmly to the proposal, saying companies that provide bank-like services should be regulated and directly supervised like banks. For more tech news, visit allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. With Wednesday morning sports on America in the morning, here's Robert Workman. College basketball number one Purdue was upset at Nebraska last night, 88-72, the Cornhuskers' first win over a top-ranked team since 1983. They took control with a 13-0 run to close out the first half. One stayed over, another shocker, as number two Houston fell at Iowa State, 57-53. The Cougars were the last unbeaten team in the nation. But the Cyclones never trailed and notched their seventh win over a top-10 team over the past two seasons. That's the most in Division One. NBA, the Kings wiped out a 20-point first-quarter deficit and pounded the Pistons 131-110. Demontis Sabonis had 37 points and a triple-double. Knicks snuffed out the Blazers, leading wire to wire for their fifth straight win. Timberwolves tore up the Magic. Minnesota also never trailed. They maintained the best record in the West. Grizzlies mauled the Mavericks, and the Lakers got 41 from Anthony Davis to get past the Raptors. The Heat and coach Eric Spolstra have agreed on an eight-year contract extension worth more than $100 million. That'll put the two-time title-winning coach among the top five in coaching salaries. Hockey, it was streaky Tuesday in the NHL. The Panthers won their eighth straight 5-1 over the Blues Matthew Kachuk with a hat trick Oilers shaded the Blackhawks 2-1 Edmonton has won eight in a row Kraken slashed the Sabres for their seventh straight victory Jets blanked the Blue Jackets for their seventh in a row 29 saves for Connor Hellebuck Winnipeg owns the best record in the league it goes the other way too the Maple Leafs slammed the Sharks San Jose has dropped its last 12 and the Kings coughed up a two-goal lead in the third losing to the Lightning in overtime LA has dropped six in a row NFL add another opening to the coaching carousel the Titans fired Mike Vrabel who suffered back-to-back losing seasons after three straight trips to the playoffs, including an AFC final appearance four years ago. There are now six head coaching vacancies up for grabs heading into wildcard weekend. That's Wednesday Sports. Thank you, sir. Robert Workman on sports. Well, stick around for the latest on the Rogers-Kimmel feud. Plus, there's Star Wars news when America in the Morning continues after these messages. Back. This is America in the Morning. New York Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers denies he implied comedian Jimmy Kimmel was a pedophile, but stopped short of apologizing. Entertainment correspondent Margie Zaraleta has the latest on the Rodgers-Kimmel feud. 
Last week on the Pat McAfee Show on ESPN, Aaron Rodgers had said a lot of people, including Jimmy Kimmel, were really hoping a list of associates of disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein doesn't come out publicly. A lot of people, including Jimmy Kimmel, are really hoping that doesn't come out publicly. All right. All right. Obviously, a clip from this particular program was run on Jimmy Kimmel's show uh, whenever Aaron brought up the, the list and then... Jimmy mocked him for it. Kimmel denied online any association with Epstein and threatened a lawsuit. Kimmel spent his monologue Monday night lacing into Rogers. Got into Cal on a football scholarship and didn't graduate. Someone who never spent a minute studying the human body is an expert in the field of immunology. He just put on a (laughs) he put on a magic helmet and that G made him a genius. Aaron got two A's on his report card. They were both in the word Aaron. Okay. (laughs) He said he'd accept an apology from Rogers, but did not expect one. On Tuesday's Pat McAfee show, Rogers says he's not stupid enough to call Kimmel a pedophile and condemned anyone who does. Rogers says as long as Kimmel understands what he actually said and that he's not accusing him of being on a list, he's all for moving forward. I'm Archie Zaroleta. Star Wars is leaping off of Disney Plus and heading to the big screen. Kevin Carr has that story. A fan favorite in the Star Wars universe is getting his own movie. What's your highest bounty? On Tuesday, Lucasfilm announced that The Mandalorian and Baby Yoda will be making the leap from Disney Plus to the big screen. Grogu? Yes, that's his name. The original series, The Mandalorian, helped launch Disney Plus in 2019, and after three seasons, continues to be one of the most popular ongoing stories in the franchise. The show follows a lone bounty hunter who takes charge of a child from Yoda's race. The commission was quite specific. The asset was to be terminated. The last Star Wars movie to hit the big screen was The Rise of Skywalker four years ago, and while that grossed a billion dollars worldwide, it got middling reviews after the new trilogy stumbled. Somehow Palpatine returned. It cannot be. The Emperor is dead. The new film will be directed by Jon Favreau, who wrote and directed the series pilot and worked on multiple episodes during its three seasons. Favreau will also produce alongside Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy and Dave Filoni, who is currently working on the second season of Ahsoka. Anakin never got to finish my training. I walked away from him. The Mandalorian and Grogu is expected to start shooting later this year for a likely 2026 release, along with another film about the new Jedi Order featuring the return of Daisy Ridley as Rey. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. I'm Kevin Carr. America in the Morning for Wednesday, January 10th, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay, senior producer Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One.